Hey everyone, Matt Brunig here. A lot of people have asked me to respond to this debate between the streamer Destiny and uh, Professor Richard Wolff, who is a uh, well-known Marxist economist and advocate of worker co-ops. Um, in fact, people have been asking me to respond to this literally for, I mean, before I even got on YouTube. Um, there was an effort at one point to try to get me on to, to debate with Destiny. I'm, I'm now interested in that, I guess, since I'm, I'm on YouTube now. So uh, if people want me to do that, then go ahead. Um, but yeah, I watched this whole thing. Um, uh, I wish I hadn't on some level. Uh, it's very long and very tedious at points, but I've decided to, to you know, pull five clips from it because I'm not going to do the whole you know, 225 hours of me sitting here and then also elaborating on it. I can't imagine any human being would ever want to watch that. So I pulled a few clips from it so that I can get uh, some highlights and then I can kind of sum it up at the end. Um, I will say as a sort of preliminary matter here, um, I find Richard Wolff's way of engage. W w Richard Wolff is a good um, is good at monologue. He's a good public speaker, an incredibly talented public speaker. Um, but that doesn't necessarily translate into debate, and it, in fact, it can be extremely frustrating in the context of debate. So as I watch this whole thing, I can the the anger that Destiny <laughs> appears to be welling up inside of him. Uh, at these very long-winded uh, answers and and kind of meandering things that Richard Wolff goes on, which again would sound great in a speech and a lecture, but is really hard when you're trying to have like a dialogue where I say something, you say something, I say. That is incredibly irritating um, to watch. So in a way, I'm very sympathetic uh, to Destiny on the kind of like uh, style of Richard Wolff being a little bit uh, hard to deal with, but... Um, I'll try to not let that, uh, you know, let, let's just talk about the substance. Uh, but in part because that is the style that Richard Wolf uh, takes, where he goes on these three, four-minute kind of odysseys, touching on all sorts of topics and, and whatever, um, I, in some cases, I'm just going to kind of like summarize what he just said, and then, and then we'll, we'll get on, because otherwise I'd have to do like 10-minute clips to get the whole, the whole little like exchange in, such as it was. So I'll do that actually with the first one here. So right before I hit play on this one, Richard Wolff has spent, you know, a, a few minutes talking about all sorts of things. But one of the big ones is he's talking about how much um, economic growth there was in the Soviet Union um, between in the middle of the last century. And that kicked off this uh, response. My understanding is that um, in the 20th century, there was a faster growing economy than the USSR, and it was Japan. Japan still exists today, and the USSR does not. I understand that the USSR did show a huge amount of growth, but I think it's odd to use that as an example when socialists often point to the evils of imperialism, um, and when you point out the fact that everybody was heavily industrializing around that time as well. I don't think it's fair to say that the USSR simply grew on the merits of socialism uh, when there were so many other things happening at the time, and when it was outgrown by another economy that was... But those are those are the facts. I mean, I, you can play whatever games you want. The fact of the matter is that the Soviet Union's performance in the 20th century completely outshines that of Japan. There's no comparison. In 1917, when the Soviet Union begins, it is the poorest country in Europe by far. It then goes through 70 years of a lost World War I, of a civil war, of an agricultural collectivization and of World War II, which did more damage in Russia than in any other country. None, notwithstanding that it was the poorest country at the beginning of this horrific story, it ends up in 1965 being the number one competitor of the United States for global hegemony. That's only because of its number one status in economic growth that it achieved the overcoming of all those horrific losses. I'm not arguing in favor of this or that about the Soviet Union, but the fact of its achievement is a staggering reality that you can dance around from here to tomorrow, but it doesn't go away because it's inconvenient to confront it. And the same thing is true now. If you read Pearl Buck 
Okay, so, you know, as a, I would say this typifies a lot of the first 10 minutes of the debate, other than like their preliminary speeches, they really get into wanting to argue about specific countries. You know, what does the USSR tell us about socialism? What does um, China tell us about socialism? And personally, I find this uh, debate to be um, uninteresting as a general matter. Um, but this particular exchange has a little bit of an important nugget in it, right? So the move here is Richard Wolf just goes, the USSR had a bunch of growth, you know, and then he, of course, loves to fill in history going back, you know, 30 years before the growth spurt for, you know, that, that's his style, fine. Um, and Destiny's reaction to that is, is really bad. I think, he's, I think he struggles in this part of the debate, just sort of on the merits of the discussion here, right? Because he says basically a couple things. One, he tries to say, uh, well, uh, Professor Wolf, you said the USSR had the fastest growth rate. Actually, I think it was Japan. But whatever, it was very fast. And say, like, okay, what are we doing here? <laughs> if USSR was number two uh, in growth rates in uh, the, uh, the 20th century, I don't think you're going to be like, well, this, so there you go. There's socialism for you. Um, but the other thing he says is um, he says that, look, I don't know that we should chalk up its growth um, to socialism. And then he says, after all, a lot of countries were industrializing at that time. And he's, he's right in a weird way, but like the way that he's right undermines his point, right? And I don't think this gets driven home very well with Richard Wolff, but like it's not that socialism causes growth or really that capitalism causes growth. Socialism and capitalism are ways of organizing production and society, the ways of organizing ownership and control, uh, decision-making authority, things like that, right? That's, that's the difference between them. But you can organize decision-making authority all sorts of ways and not get growth or, or get growth, right? Because what causes growth is actually the development of the factors of production, as I think uh, Marx would say, right? So, you know, just take like the neoclassical production uh, function, right? You've got labor, plus capital, plus everything else, which is like innovation and technology and all that kind of stuff, right? Like the way you got growth, especially in the 20th century, especially when you're coming out of an agricultural economy, it's just a very kind of like industrial technical thing, right? You go out, you uh, industrialize the farming so that you can get a bunch of people off the farms, right? So you replace a bunch of human labor with machine labor that's able to grow all your food for you. And then you take this new surplus workforce that's come off the farms, you put them into the factories, you make sure the factories have a bunch of electricity and machines, and then you can just produce, 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 right? Production and growth is, is technological in its form. That's that's what causes you to be more productive. Um, and so for him to say, well, that wasn't socialism, it was just industrialization. Well, if industrialization was able to occur under socialism, then what we see is that this link people want to draw between how you organize ownership and, and growth is not really there because you could get the growth driving factors could occur under all sorts of ways of organizing production. Um, on the facts here, although um, Destiny did, doesn't contest this really, he kind of wants, to see, I don't know, he, he admits ultimately that, yeah, the Soviet Union had a bunch of growth um, and then pivots to Japan and all that kind of stuff. But I think it's important to drive home kind of how crazy things were um, in the middle of the 20th century uh, for Russia and, and just sort of underline that Wolf is just really dead on about you know, how successful the Soviet Union was there for a good 20, 30 years. Um, so I have this paper here from Gabriel Zuckman. Uh, he writes some great papers. Uh, this one is from Soviets to Oligarchs. It was ultimately published in the Journal of Economic Inequality about uh, five years ago. When it came out, I, I was very fascinated by it. He basically just collects these long data series from Russia and then writes about how these things have changed over time. Um, but here's from the appendix of uh, this paper. So we have per adult national income, Russia versus Western Europe. Uh, all this is in 2016 euros. So it's all like adjusted for inflation. We see here red is Russia just petering along. 
um, quite a bit below. You know, I mean, in percentage terms, it's, you know, got half or even a third of what these other countries have. We get out of World War II here, right? And then just explosive growth, right? We go from 4,000 euros per adult to, let's say, 1980 as we're starting to stagnate. So that's in 35 years. We go from 4,000 euros to adults to about 16,000 euros for adults. So 400% growth in, in 35 years. Um, and it's catching up, you know, especially with Britain. Look how close it got to Britain there for a while. Um, you know, very productive. That's very impressive. And this is under a, a, you know, a very different kind of system. Now, to me, I don't think that this, again, like I said, proves socialism this or that. It just shows that different ways of organizing the economy is compatible with growth. I'll also say here, under my own approach to defining socialism, I wouldn't call the Soviet Union a socialist society because the government was not democratically controlled. I think that's the key point, right? I think state ownership is a socialist way of organizing things, but only if the state is democratically controlled. But what the Soviet Union shows is that you can have pretty different ways of organizing the economy and still have pretty significant growth. The other thing, there's other cool graphs here, right? the top 10% income. So like, this is like, this is the Russian revolution effect. The top 10% goes from having 46% of the income to 22% of the income. Um, and the 1% goes from having 18% of the income to 14% of the income. I mean, they just decimate uh, the income shares at the top. Um, and then we see this growth as well, which is kind of cool. So this is 1905 to 1956. Um, you know, growth in bottom incomes, this is the 10th percentile. The 10th percentile income grew by over 350%. As you can see, all incomes grew a little bit, uh, you know, even up to the 80th percentile, you had 300% income growth, you know, so this is this is the 80th percentile of the income distribution. And, you know, only, only about uh, above 90% do you see negative growth, and that's, of course, because there was redistribution occurring as well, these graphs here, right? So that's interesting. And they continue to grow. So this is between 1950 and 1989. So this is before the fall of the, uh, you know, fall of the Soviet Union. There's still growth here at the bottom, you know, between these, in these 43, 33 years, the bottom grew 150%. The, the 25th percentile grew 180%. Um, but you see stagnation, certainly. And now the incomes are dropping here, um, you know. At above the 60th percentile, but then look what ha look what happens post uh, post the fall of the Soviet Union. Incomes for for the poor for the bottom 90 percent are down. So between 1989 and 2016, you know, post the fall of the Soviet Union, like just it's been horrible. I mean, for 90 percent of the population, they're poorer than they once were under these particular measures. Um, and, you know, we could fight over how exactly do you compare, you know, euros for, you know, under very different systems and whatever. But, like, this is the best stab I've seen someone make. But as you can see, of course, uh, the rich, my God, they, they, they've they gone big time. So the Soviet Union kind of completely inverted there. But, um, yeah, so that's my, that's my thoughts on that. Okay, so the, for the next video, we get... Um, so leading up, I think, to the, to the part I'm going to play, again, we get a nice six, seven minute monologue from Richard Wolff in which he explains, uh, you know, because a big part of Destiny's frustration here is he's like, what is socialism? It's so, it's so hard to grasp. Like, it's just kind of, it seems like it's all over the place and like I can't get my handle on it or whatever. Um, and part of, part of me is like a little, un, I don't know. I'm sympathetic to it, but I'm also kind of like, you know, you could read, like there are books, you know, but, but I also think that, that that's not the way you should react to people. You should be able to explain it. Richard Wolff tries to explain it by saying, well, there's three kinds of socialist kind of approaches. One is basically just government regulation. Um, two, so government regulation of production. Two is state ownership. And then three is worker co-ops, basically. Those are the three kind of different approaches. And he doesn't say that's exhaustive of all the approaches that uh, have existed, but that's his, uh, his way of, of going into it. So let's see where they go from here.
permit that. The folks at the top want to keep the power to keep their inordinate wealth, even at the expense of no democracy and of a growth record inferior to what Russia did in the 20th century and what China is doing now. And that's an enormous price to pay. Okay, so if you want to talk about the two and three definitions of socialism, that would be interesting to me. But I only heard two definitions of socialism here. Number one is just capitalism. Um, I, I don't know when. So number one, again, is like regulation. This like redefining happened of taking capitalism plus government intervention I'll, and I'll calling it. Wait, 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 let me let me finish. Right. I don't, okay. I don't know why this was the case that uh, state intervention into private markets to have some form of regulation or some form of socialized healthcare or giving workers five weeks off became socialism. It is clearly not socialism. It's so not socialism that I think Marx himself even said that the state would be heavily required in maintaining capitalism, uh, more so than I guess even Marx was able to foresee because he predicted a, a revolution of the proletariat in his lifetime. Um, the idea that the state intervening and providing some sort of social welfare or safety net is is that's just strictly a capitalist system with some government intervention. Um, if we want to talk about the concept of the government owning and operating enterprises, or number three, the idea is that the workers themselves have some like worker managed thing, um, I, I would be interested in, in discussing either of those two options, as I believe all five questions I laid out initially applied to them. But for number one, I just I wholly reject that as a form of capital uh, as a form of socialism. If you believe it is, I'd be curious if you can tell me what is the difference between the the first thing you laid out and any capitalist that acknowledges that some level of government intervention is necessary in keeping the economy going. I'd be glad to explain it to you. The history of socialism gets going in the middle of the 19th century. And at that time, socialists began to argue that capitalism was over, capitalism was done, and, and a better system was available and should be pursued. And they had a whole bunch of ideas about that. They were a relatively small group. If you know the history of Marx and Marxism, it began. Okay, I'm going to pause it there or just end it there. Um... I think this is a frustrating part of the debate because I think what I wish Wolf would just because Wolf has a particular view about what he wants. He wants to just spread worker co-ops throughout society. Um, he's decided to present that view with these very long stories about feudalism and slavery and and the history of Marxism and this and so and and it it kind of clouds things um so like his answer here is basically just, just to say well look a lot of people have called themselves socialists over the years and there have been lots of different strategies within socialism and so when i'm trying to like discuss things here i'm kind of trying to just kind of give you the bigger picture of of all these different things right so the argument that people would make that would say well regulation like uh, is is a form of socialism is to say well think about it right when the government regulates what a company can do it is exerting control over the productive apparatus of society right so the particular thing that it says you company must do you must provide um, vacation to the workers like the example he gives or you company must not do that in that case the government is taking over the executive function of of the productive unit of all the productive units usually if it's kind of like an economy wide regulation and so yeah you could see an argument that says well look if socialism is about uh, collective uh, if socialism is a way of organizing the production of society in which instead of having these external shareholder capitalists make decisions, we all collectively make decisions. And then you say, well, we elect the government and then the government uh, makes a decision about how production is going to be organized through regulation. And so in that little slice, isn't that kind of semi-socialistic? Um, I don't really go for that. And the weird thing is Richard Wolff doesn't go for that either. So they spend this long period of time and destiny doesn't go for like, I feel like all three of us are sitting here saying that's not really, that's kind of a bullshit <laughs> position. Um, but he nonetheless wants to spend a lot of time kind of just saying, you know, but there are some people who think that and, and they've been in the tradition and whatever. And it's, it's very, it's a lot of time wasting as far as I'm concerned in the debate, but that's kind of where it, where it is. Um, the other thing is, dude, 
Socialism began in the middle of the 19th century. The canon begins in the, in the, in the late 18th century. That's when we get the, the Jacobins. <laughs> that's, that's the formal starting point of so everyone knows in the canon. It doesn't start with Marx. And if anyone has watched my or listened to my socialism series on my podcast, The Brunigs, uh, which you can subscribe to at patreon.com slash the Brunigs. If you listen to my socialism series, you'll know that there's a lot of stuff that happens before Marx. Um, but yeah, so again, I feel like a wasted opportunity for clash, like uh, if you're familiar with the old debate terminology, because I don't know why he doesn't just come out and be like, I love worker co-ops, let's talk about those. And instead, we're here 25 minutes in and they're having a fight about whether regulation counts as socialism, even though neither of them really thinks it does. Um, so, okay. So, next part. So, finally, we get to the worker co ops. It took, takes us 30 minutes to get into the worker co ops. And this debate is only an hour and 30 minutes. So, we've already exhausted a third of the debate over China's, is China socialist or capitalist? Is the USSR's explosive growth? Do we get to chalk that up to socialism? Um, is regulation socialism well in the tradition? It's a diverse tradition. There's lots of different threads, but I don't think so. But also, okay, so we're 35 minutes in, and finally we, we get to the thing that Richard Wolff is known for, which is worker co-ops. Um, and I don't remember exactly what preceded this. He's just kind of given his spiel about worker co-ops. And, you know, again, he's a great orator, but there's no... He's just giving his spiel about why worker co-ops are good. So let's, I forget again where this goes, but let's see. Give you a wage at the end of the week. You're going to give me your brains and muscles for these hours of these. So that he's just describing capitalism here. We're going to make, and that's how we organize production. That's the distinction of capitalism. No, that's it's what not. I mean it's, that's by the, capitalism. No, you haven't given me a definition of capitalism at all. You've told me a bunch I, of things that capitalism isn't, and then you've given me a bunch of random collected facts of history, but none of these things not at all. are... Wait, hold, absolutely. For instance, when you talk about how markets aren't unique to capitalism, that's great. Worker management isn't unique to socialism. Worker management can exist under a capitalist system right now. Well, I, I know that you like to talk about right. Mondragon a lot. I Mondragon... Never... All right, yeah. I'm pretty sure I wanted to pause it there. Um... Okay, so a couple things are going on at this point, right? So <laughs> Destiny gets frustrated because Richard Wolf, when he asks him sort of like, what's capitalism? And he just wants to, you know, like that's a pretty big part of this. If we're going to do, Richard Wolf goes against five, six minutes to talk about here's what feudalism was and here's what slavery was and whatever. And like Destiny, and I, like I said before, very sympathetic. He just wants Wolf to be like, all right, here's my view. Capitalism is A, B, and C. But at the end of his long monologue, he does actually explain what he thinks is the key to the definition of capitalism, which is that you have employers and employees. Employees are under a quote-unquote free labor regime, meaning that they're not serfs, they're not slaves, they, tr they, they sell their labor in, in a market to a capitalist who controls a firm and the firm is controlled by like shareholders or private owners or whatever and like that's the centerpiece of it but at, at by the time he's finally you know put that out in the last 30 seconds of like an eight minute monologue i feel like destiny is so frustrated he just blips right over it and so ends up just saying you haven't told me what this is you haven't told me what this is the other thing that they're both struggling with and you see this very clearly come out in this exchange here, and he says this a number of times, is when he says, look, uh, you're, you're saying you want worker co-ops, you're saying you want worker co-ops, but look, worker co-ops exist in capitalism, so how can they be socialistic? And the problem they're running into here is there is a, the way we talk about capitalism is so, and socialism is we talk about it as describing economies, or really describing, uh, well, national economies. And in fact, oftentimes is describing countries, right? So we say, the, we say ch China, or the United States, or Finland, or whatever, by which we usually mean their national economy. Um, 
But even that is, I, I think, very mistaken. And I wrote this, I wrote a piece about this a long time ago. I think it was called Socialist Countries and Socialist Institutions. Anyways, if, ca- if socialism and capitalism are different ways of organizing production, the best unit to apply those labels to is going to be a productive unit in the society. It's not the going to be the economy, really, right? Because the economy is the aggregation of the productive units. It's kind of an abstraction. It's kind of a, it's a useful word to describe sort of the, the totality of the production and distribution of goods in society. Uh, it's a useful word to describe a, a study of those things, i.e. economics. Um, but it's not necessarily a useful description Um, Or rather, I should say, the words socialism and capitalism are not necessarily usefully applied to the economy as a whole. Um, And like I said, I think it's more usefully applied to a specific productive unit. So what is a productive unit? Well, it goes by all sorts of names, but, you know, usually you would say company or a firm or an enterprise or whatever, right? We all know if you go to a job board and, uh, you know, you're looking for jobs, like the thing that's listed on it, like uh, the company's account, that is a productive unit, right? Walmart is a productive unit. The uh, school, your, your public school is a productive unit. The post office is a productive unit. Um, all sorts of, co- you, know, you know, I mean, I'm not, so to me, I think it's a lot better to start with the idea that Some productive units are organized socialistically and some productive units are organized capitalistically, right? So in the case of a worker co-op, why would we say that that entity, that particular productive entity, that firm is socialistic? The reason we would say that is because in a worker co-op, the top management typically, right? I mean, there are different ways of organizing, but the top management of the company is elected by the workers in that company, and the workers also own the equity of the company, right? So it's all internal to the firm. The workers own and control the shares, the equity of the company. They appoint leadership. That's how the power flows. In a more traditional capitalist organized firm, you have external shareholders who own the equity and external shareholders who appoint board members who then appoint CEOs and on down the chain, right? So it's it's the different ways that their corporate governance structure is organized that distinguishes one as a capitalist enterprise and one as a socialist enterprise. And what he runs into is he goes, how can that be, how can you call worker co-op socialist when there are worker co-ops that exist in a capitalist economy? And it's to say, well, the worker co-op, and the best way to kind of re- respond to this, which Wolf doesn't do, it would be to say, okay, Destiny, think about this. What if all the companies were worker co-ops? Would that still be a capitalist country? No, no, I guess not. I guess that wouldn't be a cap. Okay, so then how does that work? How can it be? It's capitalist if it's there's only some of them, but it's socialist if there's a bunch of them. And it's like, well, no, right? The firm... A particular co-op is a socialist organization, and then whether the economy is socialist or not is is kind of a a judgment call you have to make, I guess, about the density of of socialist organized productive entities versus capitalist organized productive entities. And if you can just distinguish between those two levels, between the economy wide level and the and the level of 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 a productive unit or a company or a firm or whatever, you're going to clear things up. You're going to clear things up a lot better. <laughs> Um, and neither of them do this. So they want to talk about, they move back and forth between describing an economy as, as socialist, but then talking about specific um, f- firm structures, but then those firm structures could exist in an economy that we would colloquially refer to as capitalist, and of course, vice versa. And so it's all kind of muddle-headed. And of course, that's Destiny's uh, sort of uh, big uh, uh, complaint over and over again. It's just how like muddled it all is. But but is partially muddled because he's also muddling it, right? He, he's failing to appreciate the idea that, well, we, we can talk about productive entities and then we can also talk about the economies and we can apply labels to both. And, you know, like he seems like a fairly clear-headed person, but in this case, he's also not making steps to clear it up. Now, granted, again, it's ultimately really Richard Wolf should be doing this, but 
you know, he's failing at this as well, I think. Like at the point at which you go, well, if a worker co-op can exist in a capitalist society, then it cannot be socialist. Um, you've you fucked up your analysis as well, you know. So let's move on. Radically. Okay, so this is they're going to talk about the financing of worker co-ops. I think this is an interesting exchange here. Um, because Destiny is he he is he wins the exchange, I guess I would say. He's also slightly wrong, but Richard Wolf is really off in kind of La La Land on this one. Um, and so, yeah, they're talking about what if you have a worker co-op? How do you get investment into it? And uh, weirdly, Richard Wolf says, "Well, you could just sell shares, just like you sell shares of a normal capitalist enterprise," and, and like. You know, we'll see. To raise capital for their business by selling shares. Of course they could do that. Those shares would not allow the people who own them to do the steps that they can in capitalism. They would not, for example, be able to dictate who's the board of directors because the workers themselves are their own board of directors. Mm -hmm. But there's no problem with private investment there never was. And my question One is, of the most, why? Let me give for, you an well, no, no, I don't One need an example. No example. We we have the we have this definition. Okay, I just want to hone in on this definition. Okay, my question is, is, why would any individual ever invest in a company that doesn't have a fiduciary responsibility to their investors? So, for instance, in your world, if I were to buy twenty percent of a co-op, their workers tomorrow could say, you know what? We're all bored. We don't want to do this anymore. We're going to move on. We're shutting the business down. And now I've just completely lost out on my investment because they have no responsibility to me because I have non-controlling shares. If the only shares you're selling are non-controlling, why would any private investment ever come in knowing that that co-op never has an obligation to make a profit or return a dividend to the investors? There's many companies I'm listed on the stock exchange right now that pay no dividends to their investors here in the United States. It's a normal no, part of our No, no, absolutely not. They might not pay what are you a talking about you, the, I'm talking about capital markets 101. They might not pay a dividend, but then they are. You're, then you're they, badly missing. I'm not most, bad. I promise most. you, the foundation of the stock market in the United States is a returning of capital to the people that are the ones doing the investment in companies. Now, it might be the case, as you correctly not point out, all. it might. It, absolutely, it might be the no, case. It, really, really, yeah, you're really. Just, you're unaware. You're, 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 no, most no, of no. the most of the most dynamic companies in this country are selling stock to people to whom they have no responsibility, legal or otherwise, to give them a dividend ever. Okay, Professor, do you believe that a dividend is the only way that you can return capital to shareholders? That's not the point. That absolutely <laughs> is the point. You made, no, you made the point, what is the company responsible for? The company is responsible to run the company. They are not responsible to give money back, whether it's dividend, return of capital, or any other way to the people who give them the money to buy shares. It absolutely the people who give them the money are gambling. They hope that they can sell the shares for more, and they will sell the shares to anybody who can buy them. The company is not responsible to buy those shares. The company is not responsible for what price they can get. If they lose their shirt, tough luck. It's not an obligation or a responsible. That's the way the law of this country works for the stock market. And there's no problem in a worker co-op saying to investors, we're going to grow better than what you can get from a capitalist enterprise. So buying a share of our stock will give you a better shot to sell it at a higher price later. And I can give you examples. Wait, I'm I don't I don't do want that. examples. No, 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 no. I, we don't need examples because I'm going to give you an example of a company that did that just so you can see why an investor would do it. OK, <laughs> all right. So let's uh, let's decode this a little bit. So part of the problem here is. And I, I don't know what Richard, I honestly don't know what Richard Wolf is doing here. Back in the day, someone might, he, is he genuinely confused or is he being like a pedantic uh, kind of like person where he's taking advantage of legal formalisms to argue something that's not really the case, right? So what he's talking about is that under, um, uh, you know, under like, general corporate law, you learn this in law school, um, the directors of a company 
um, their duty, um, they have a fiduciary duty, right? So we talk about CEOs, board members, stuff like that. They have a fiduciary duty, but their fiduciary duty is to make decisions that pursue the corporation's interests with reasonable diligence and prudence. This fiduciary duty is owed by directors and officers to the corporation, not to the corporation's stakeholders or broader society. So as a legal matter, and this is kind of vague, um, but as a legal matter, the obligation of a CEO is not to its shareholders, it's to the corporation like as an entity, but it's sort of unclear well, what the fuck does that mean? <laughs> like, um, but it's not to the shareholders. They don't have an... And, and they also have no obligation to do a dividend. They have no obligation to buy the stock uh, of a company. They have no obligation to even pursue... They don't have to pursue profit maximization uh, for the company. They don't, ha- they, don't re- you know, they don't really have to do anything. They have a kind of very abstract duty to just like reasonably diligent and you know pursue the corporation's interest and in practice it's not just that that this is kind of the vague way that it's defined but in practice you think about well how if a shareholder does have a right with respect to the director's behavior how do they exercise that right right because that's really where the rubber meets the road how do you actually sue a company and and a director for not meeting their duties like what do you have to prove what burden do you have to overcome and the issue there is if you do sue a ceo as a shareholder and you say oh he's he's not uh, practicing reasonable diligence with respect to the company's interest or whatever uh we have this thing called the business judgment rule or the business judgment presumption and under this presumption uh, a court will uphold any decision a director makes as long as they're made in good faith with the care that a reasonably prudent person would use and with the reasonable belief that the director is acting in the best interests of the corporation. This presumption is extreme, I mean, almost impossible to overcome. Like, unless you can prove that the CEO specifically was like self dealing and was like doing fraud and that kind of thing, unless you can get to that level it's going to be very hard to ever sue a CEO because the CEO can just say, well, look, I acted in good faith. I thought this would be good for the company. I, you know, maybe it didn't turn out the way I wanted it to turn out um, or the way the shareholders wanted it to turn out, but I thought it was a good idea and I didn't benefit from it. There was no like self-dealing aspect of it. There was no fraud aspect to it. There was no any of that. And so I'm good to go. And that's true as a as a like legal matter. So this is this is the the law that Wolf is kind of trying to coast on to be like, hey, it's already the case that even private companies, it doesn't matter whether you're profitable or not. So why why couldn't a co-op just raise money uh, by selling shares? Because it's the same thing, you know. Um, <laughs> and the answer to this question is that even though it's not it's not like illegal for a business to not pursue you know, profits and returns for its shareholders. The shareholders control the company, right? The shareholders can uh, uh, kick out the board, put in a new CEO, and then force it to do that, right? So the reason that the companies act that way is because the shareholders are the ultimate owners and the shareholders have the power to do these things. But in his co-op world, as he explains at the very beginning of that clip, they're not going to have that power anymore. Right when you buy a, a share of a stock, you're not gonna be able to uh, kick out the board and the CEO if they're not trying to, uh, you know, generate returns for you. Whether those are dividends, whether they do it through uh, price gains in the stock, or uh, you know things like that. Right. So the point Destiny is making, though they get bogged down in this legal discussion, is that. If you knock out the shareholder's ability to force the company to act in its interest, then no one's going to buy the shares. So you're not going to be able to raise capital in the stock market, right? Because you've cut off the thing where the shareholders, they feel like they have a leash on the company, right? And that, and that leash on the company is what gets the company acting in a way that benefits the shareholders and whatever. If you say, well, you could still buy the share, but now you don't get to have any voting control. And we're also a co-op, so we're really just worried about the workers in the firm. 
I mean, destiny is correct. It's insane to believe that in general, anyone's going to buy <laughs> those kinds of shares, right? It'll be a very, very, very different system. But here's the other thing that's very frustrating about this. For some reason, Wolf decides to die on this hill of making this kind of cutesy legal argument to reach this kind of, you know, back uh, this sort of bank shot argument that says that, oh, co-ops could just raise money by selling shares. They could raise money by, by you know, uh, uh, going on the stock market just like any, any other company would, when instead he could much more easily and in, and in a way that's much more consistent with the co-op literature, he could say, look, selling shares, equity is not the only way a company can get financing. The other way they get financing is through debt, is through bonds. In fact, that is the primary way that companies get real, actual financing for what they do. Shareholding, and the, the companies don't sell equity to raise money. That does that basically doesn't exist outside of some seed stage like VC stage stuff. They don't do it, right? The amount of secondary offerings, as they're called, they don't exist. Shares are ways to cash out and share sales, cash out initial owners, and then from there they just move from owner to owner speculatively. They're not used to actually bring cash in the firm so that you can invest. I mean, this has been proven time and time again. That's not where companies get funds for investments. The the way they get funds for investment is first and foremost with retained earnings, right? So the profits from the prior year, they hold on to them and then they invest them. And then after that, they go to the bond market, they go to the debt market. And and for a co-op, the bond market and the debt market should still be there, right? And the bond market and the debt market, you go to some person who has money and you say, hey, I want to borrow money. I'll either sell you a bond, which is basically a loan, or you can give me a bank loan or whatever, and I'll pay it back with interest. And in that case, I have an obligation to pay you back with interest. You know you're going to get a return because the terms of you giving me the money is I'm going to pay you back with interest, right? But when uh, people buy bonds or they do bank loans, they don't have any voting right in the firm. They don't get to uh, pick the board or anything like that. So that's your answer. Like that's what Richard Wolff should have said. He should have said co-ops can raise money in the debt markets. They won't raise money in the equity markets because equity markets only work because shareholders are, I mean, for the most part, they only work because shareholders are given voting rights over the firm that makes them feel comfortable that they can get the firm to act in their interest and generate profits for them and whatever. That's all going to kind of get destroyed in this co-op model because we're not going to give them any voting rights over the firm. So, you know, realistically, people probably are not going to buy these shares. But the debt markets will still be fine because the debt markets already, you don't get any control over what the firm does. It's just that you are, you get, there's a contractual obligation to pay you back with interest. And that's why you lend to them. And you have to decide basically, do you think the company is going to go bankrupt or not? Um, but that's his answer. Debt markets, not equity markets. Debt markets, not equity markets. That's why the co-op can still finance because there's debt markets, not equity markets. And instead, he goes, no, they could raise equity and then does this legal bullshit. Um, so where do I wind up on this clip? I wind up in this confused position because, one, Richard Wolff uses this legal argument that really confuses the issue. But then, two, Destiny... He doesn't seem to understand the legal. He kind of goes in on trying to say, no, there is a legal duty. It's a fiduciary duty and whatever. And he's wrong about that. The fiduciary duty is to the corporation, not the company. So his move should have been, look, whatever, like, the point is not, do they, are they legally obligated to pursue the interests of the shareholders? The point is that because shareholders control the company and own the company, they do because they can exert that power and get them to do it. And when you cut that off, there's not going to be any reason for shareholders to ever buy shares and blah, 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 right? So Wolf is, is wrong. Wolf is right on the legal point, but the legal point's irrelevant. Destiny then pursues the legal point and makes an argument about fiduciary duty that's not true. The argument that he could have made would have defeated Wolf's point, and he kind of makes it a little bit in saying, like, look, just whatever it is, shareholders are not going to buy it because they're not going to have any reason to believe they're going to get any return. He's right. He, he, that point that he's angling towards is correct, 
But Wolf has an obvious answer that he should have started with from the beginning, which is to say shareholders will just, or rather co-ops will just ac access the bond markets, the debt markets, not the equity markets. And in the bond markets and the, de the debt markets, they, people will invest because they will have a contractual right to be paid back with interest. Everything is fucked. In this in this clip, like there's there's so many ways through, and it's just fucked. It's like everyone is just fucking wrong. Um, it's very frustrating. It's very frustrating. Um, that's me too. This is me, but this is me and everyone involved in this. You know. Um, all right, so let's finish it here. Um, shelter or. Um, <clears throat> or other like basic necessities. I just don't see how a socialist society solves literally any of these things. And I don't feel like I've ever been given an adequate explanation by any socialist for how they would organize their society. Um, usually these arguments are incredibly amorphous or vague such that literally everything is socialism. Like you can still have private enterprise and co-ops and the government does some things and voila, that's socialism, which just sounds like liberalism to me with government intervention, which is liberalism. Um, or they try to make arguments for more strict forms of socialism. Um, uh, but I think that it's hard to get them to admit that in those stricter forms of socialism, they would disallow things like private investment. And I guess it bothers me because so many innovations and things have existed only under the framework of capitalism that even with public research and public pushing, you weren't able to get. For instance, I believe the LED was discovered um, or was invented in, in, in Russia like 100 years ago. And it wasn't until Western private enterprise took a hold of that invention and started utilizing it that anybody was able to actually enjoy the invention. All right, so you know he basically ends the debate, and I and I, I again sympathize with it, just kind of being like, I still don't know what socialism is, and he's but it, you know, he's responding really to Wolf's style, which is he's right, is to say it's kind of amorphous. He wants to tell you about history, he wants to tell you about socialist diversity. He kind of moves on and on, um, and yeah, this is the part at the end because this is it I, I, wolf has already made his thing like this is it the next hour of the debate there's no debate left it looks like there's an hour left in the video that was one of the things that was so daunting when i first started this but actually he just talks to his uh he just live streams to his followers from for the next hour but um that's basically the conclusion of the debate and like i said at the very beginning this is one of the things where i'm like People, I see why so many people contacted me and were like, you need to talk to this guy. Because he apparently did a number of these videos with other socialists. And, you know, his big complaint is just a lack of lucidity, a lack of like specific answering, a lot, you know, just like talking in these very winding ways. And I'm, I am the opposite of that. <laughs> like, no one has ever accused me of being not lucid. Uh, or not being succinct and not like answering the question like dead on. Um, and so, yeah, I leave this thinking I should hop on with Destiny, not in a kind of I want to, you know, we need to, uh, I, I don't even, the weird thing is like in terms of what he seems to want and the way he kind of engages, I feel a common bond with him, like as a debater, I guess, if you will, in some way. Like I see what's frustrating him and I get it. I'm very sympathetic to it. So I, I, I'm not really even inclined to be like, I want to get in because I could definitely own and like, you know, torch this person. Um, but actually, because I think I might even be able to like to convince him if I could just lay it out instead of doing the thing that he hates that everyone else does, which is going to talk about the 19th century and the, and the you know, and like that kind of shit. Um, and just lay out, here's here's my thought. I've got a very clear vision of this. I'll recognize it's not the exclusive vision that falls under the banner of socialism, but I've got a particular line. I can explain every piece of it, tell you how I want to get there. Um, and it's very consistent with with the socialist canon. And, I, you know, I can, I can do all of that for him. Um, so maybe I'll get an opportunity to, I don't know. Um, I, I guess I should reach out more um, to him. But... Other than that, you know, I mean, I think the critique is is reasonable in this case, that at the end of this video, we kind of don't get a whole lot from Wolf. We spend the first half hour on other countries and what they all tell us about growth and China and Russia, and, and then we get this kind of stumbling through of worker co-ops, um, which are never really all that well explained, and then that all kind of 
crescendos with this real clumsy discussion of corporate finance. And I don't, nothing from the debate was really very clean or useful. And I do put that mostly at the foot of Wolf because Wolf never, never would give like a one word answer or even a, a, a one paragraph answer. And the answers he did give would, would get become so wide ranging that it just became hard to have a debate in the way that I think it's good to have a debate, which also I think is the way that Destiny thinks it's good to have a debate. So that's my take. That's my take. So, um, yeah. I'm going to have another video out soon, actually, where I'm going to try to explain a little bit more of like socialism in the context of corporate governance, which sounds maybe boring, but like I think actually this video, this debate is what made me think I should do it because I think I can clear up a lot with just like, like a handful of flow charts <laughs> where I just, I show you how different um, productive entities can be organized, like how the board structure works, how the shareholder structure works, who like there's, I don't know, six or seven different ways you can do that. Um, and I can say this, this way is a socialistic way of, of setting up corporate governance. And this is a, a capitalistic way of setting up corporate governance. And that just goes back to the point I was making for about how it's useful, how it's best to think about socialism on the level of a specific productive enterprise, as opposed to on the level of a whole economy or a whole country. Like that's the best place to start if you want to get crisp, because so much of the lack of clarity comes from moving between those two things. Um, and and, you know, I think I've got a way through that should be very clear and should be very compelling. Um, and so, yeah, wait for that video. But there you have it. Um, disappointment. Disappointment in the debate. And in everyone involved. That's my take. <laughs>